Hello, everybody. And this is Stacy from The Advisor. I'm very excited today because we have a very special guest today. It is Lonnie Summers. And he has an amazing story to tell that he wants to share with the world. And he's just an amazing gentleman that has done a lot of things in life. But I'm going to give the uh, the microphone to him since that's one of his professional uh, little uh, <laughs> tweaks. He, and he'll tell you all about that, too. And uh, so, Lonnie, tell everybody a little about yourself, what you do, and uh, you know, share it with the world because you have an amazing story to tell. Oh, wonderful. Well, Stacey, I'm so honored to be part of the podcast today and I'm very excited and uh, I love the mic reference. Um, <laughs> for children of the late 70s, early 80s, there was a wonderful toy that was out called Mr. Microphone. <laughs> I had a bunch of those. Uh, my kids today have no idea what the heck that was, but <laughs> I and, uh, um, as we were talking pre-meeting, I've never met a microphone I haven't loved, but um it's not so much hearing myself. I just love inspiring people and getting people to share their stories and stuff. But a little bit about me. Um, geez, there's I've had a very wide, varied career. Um, but a bit about my story. I'm, I guess currently I'm, I'm, um, I live in a suburb of Denver, Colorado. I have a beautiful, wonderful wife that we've been almost married for going on, I think now, 27 years this July. And um, we have two beautiful, identical twin daughters that graduate college in May. So that is um, unbelievable uh, yeah. that that's even happening because I don't consider myself, I don't consider them that old to be doing that nor myself that old to have twin daughters that are graduating college. <laughs> but um, um, kind of my story is... You know, the the kind of funny, there's a lot of different variations to the story, a lot of different chapters. Um, but I think in particular, I like to share how one moment can really change your life. And when I was um, very young, unfortunately, um, uh, I had a uh, alcoholic, very verbal, threatening, abusive father. And um, uh, it was very tumultuous. Um, finally, my parents um, got a divorce, which was for me a, a blessing. Um, but life was really tough. My mom is a wonderful person and she grew up on a farm in Kansas, but was very much kind of her dream was to be a homemaker. So her dreams were kind of dashed too. So it was a really hard time for her to, to be on her own. Um, and uh, we I have an older brother. Um, he was pretty much moved out and on his own by then. And um, uh, life was life was a little bit tough. I mean, certainly didn't have it the worst, but it wasn't normal. It was kind of depressing. It was hard. I was very much an introvert. I didn't really have a group of friends and didn't really have inspiration and aspirations, uh, didn't really have role models. And uh, uh, I remember that um, my when I was 14 years old, my, my brother was like, you are going to quit sitting around on the couch. Um, it's summertime. You should be working. I don't care that you're 14. Of course, in the 80s, um, it didn't matter. People did work at 14. Now it's a little bit harder, yeah. um, unless you're a content uh, creator, and that's a whole world I'm still trying to get familiar with. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, uh, there was a department store, a, a drug store the, that he was assistant manager at, and he had me work there. And kind of the the manager would give me a little bit under the table at the time, and I would clean shelves and do kind of a lot of not so much fun work, but uh, it kind of instilled in me a work ethic, but in particular, the moment that really changed things. And I would say, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't very outgoing, again, very much of an introvert. I didn't really have um, any goals or aspirations and it's kind of, it's really kind of depressed. We had a tough time after my family, uh, my parents were divorced. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people I was close to in the family, we had a lot of deaths in the family and I lost a lot of close people to me. So it kind of felt as a kid during that time frame that I was just kind of losing people that were close to me, people I loved and it isolated me. And my mom was having a tough time going through things too. And so I was very lonely. Um, again, kind of that depressed type thing. With that preface kind of given, um, I was waiting for a bus after work one day and it was in the afternoon and there was some Native Americans um, outside of the bus stop. Um, There's like three or four of them. Um, for me being a 14 year old kid, it was very intimidating. They had obviously been drinking and it was just before the bus was coming and they approached me. So I was very scared of this particular interaction. Um, uh, but it actually completely changed my entire outlook and trajectory in life with that one moment. And what happened is one of them, which in my mind at that time was an elder of kind of the group there, um, looked at me and said, 
I see something very special in an aura about you. And of course, I was kind of apprehensive because I didn't know where they were approaching me. And I was kind of worried what was going to happen. So I didn't really take it full in at that moment. But he goes, you know, I, I didn't do well with my life. I became, an, you know, I, I drink and I didn't really aspire to do much. And I haven't been there for my family. But he goes, I see a special aura about you. And he goes, just remember, don't do what I did. You can do anything that you want to do. You can become anything that you want to become. Wow. And you should do it. And, you know, it's interesting because we have parents and things like that and, and friends and stuff like that that always say, oh, you can do anything you can. But to have a completely unsolicited moment um, where somebody saw something in you, that particular thing completely changed my life. Yeah. And at that point in time, it was like, well, why why can't I be the people I admire? Why can't I be people that I see in the world um, whether it be obviously when we were all kids I think we had actors and musicians that we aspired to we looked up to couldn't act and I certainly couldn't sing so I knew that wasn't that but they did amazing things and became very successful and that particular moment really changed for me and it all became about um, seeing what I could do trying different things and ex and trying to excel in those things and it certainly uh, wasn't a smooth road up there were definitely you know ups and downs and learning curves um, you fast forward a little bit today, which I'm sure we'll talk a bit more how I got to where I'm at here now, but, um, um, I, I kind of, in that particular time really, uh, found a program called junior achievement. Um, it's much different today than it was then, but they had this company program that you did at school extracurricular at night. It was called the night program. And you created a company with others and you bought and sold products and you learned how to do a business plan and all that. And I really kind of excelled in that area. So I, for those of you that were, again, kind of, obviously it's going to give my age away because I'm children of the 80s, um, but we're uh, family ties friends or family ties fans. Um, I was completely Alex P. Keith in high school <laughs> and all about the business side of stuff. Um, but it's interesting how other things in life change your trajectory Yeah, um, to where I'm at today. That's amazing. And I find it so amazing that a, a complete stranger came up to you and said those things to you intoxicated or not it was just the message that he got across you know i i always believe that everything happens for a reason and there is no coincidences and you know for someone to say that and look at the impact it had on your on your life it you know it really made you think and it really made you look at life differently even at that young of an age and that shows you right then and there that it doesn't matter how old you are you know whatever happens to us in life really plays a toll on our future as adults and you know even though you had those challenges and you had to grow up in a dysfunctional home with an alcoholic father those words from that that gentleman completely changed your life which is amazing to me yeah thank you and like i said it definitely wasn't a, a, a smooth path up um definitely uh, a lot of uh, bumps and and ups and downs and but i think that's how it always goes i mean even today and i'm sure you can attest to this to do you've had an amazing success in helping so many people um and stuff but you know life isn't perfect life is it, i think is a beautiful gift Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it can be messy and yeah. it's, there's a lot of ups and downs that take place. And sometimes we've had it, obviously, you know, the, the, I always say the 1920s were the, the 1920s were always the roaring twenties, the 2020s seem to be for me anyway, because it seems like, oh, COVID now what? And then we have keep, it seems like every year we've got something kind of wild that keeps happening to us. And, yeah. um, I kind of call them the WTF twenties, uh, <laughs> cause it's like, are you kidding me? What else is could be potentially happening? But, yeah. um, you know, the, the the things that instilled after that interaction was really working on bettering myself and then now what i get to do um is uh in reading more up on you and learning more about you obviously it's so much about healthy being healthy and healthy lifestyles and stuff and um, my wife and i co-own a company called hal sports and hal isn't a person actually is an acronym that stands for healthy active living mm -hmm. and it's just kind of a whole concept of Healthy, active living. What does that mean? It's it's balance in life, and and it's you know reading and spending time with family, and it's okay to indulge in some fun you know treats and things. It doesn't have to always be about I had fifteen protein shakes and did four million pushups and ran four marathons today. Right. It isn't about that. It's about trying to create a healthy balance, and and, and I'm not perfect at it. I'm still always trying to balance. You kind of 
teeter totter one way a little bit and you have to write things a little bit and sometimes it requires you know, work that you do sometimes has to take a little bit more focus and then you reprioritize things and go back. But, um, you know, another amazing thing that really changed my life is kids. You know, they say kids change your life and mine really did. And that really set at the time previous to kids, I was very much that Alex P. Keaton going for business and learning and, and trying to be a leader and contributing. But I wouldn't say I was really giving much to the community at large. Right. And uh, my wife uh, comes from a very Catholic background. And most of the time you got married, you had kids right away. We didn't. So we always got the proverbial, when are you guys going to have kids? Never <laughs> She's like, I'm never getting grandkids out of them. And, and her side of it was like, it's been two years and you still don't have kids. You know, you should be like on number three by now. And uh, um, we surprised everybody uh, the fifth year in our marriage that not only were we finally having a child, we were having twins. <laughs> Uh, uh, I can be very verbose again, kind of like in the microphone. When we found out we were having twins, Stacy, I think it was the only time I was ever silent for 48 hours. I was, <laughs> but um, the, and I was so excited. We were having um, um, identical twin daughters. So I was going to get two beautiful daddy's girls. I was thrilled. Couldn't be happier. Um, we were kind of having the model pregnancy. And then in March of 2003, in the 20th week of our pregnancy, we were diagnosed. We went to a regular, what we thought was going to be a regular checkup. Yeah. And the the OB we had was this amazing, charismatic, just kind person. But he didn't come in that way that day. He was very concerned. He looked had a look of something was really wrong. And we found out we were diagnosed with something called twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And real quickly, what that is. Um, identical twins share about 80% of the time they share a placenta. And you can think that the placenta has shared blood vessels. So they kind of share that placenta and they share blood vessels. So in about 30% of cases, what, what twin to twin transfusion syndrome is one baby gets a disproportionate amount of blood and nutrients versus the other baby. And the one baby that isn't getting enough becomes very anemic. They can't grow. The other that's getting too much is almost getting two to three times their blood volume and their body can't handle that. Wow. So they start, they start getting something called high drops, which is a buildup of fluid inside their heart can't operate very well. Cause it's under a lot of stress, trying to pump a lot of blood. That is, that's a lot more than it's used to. Yeah. Uh, when we were diagnosed, um, we got diagnosed. We went on the internet. Everything was doom and gloom information. We went to hire a specialist the next day. She was pretty much gave us two options. You can terminate this pregnancy or you can yeah. let him die in utero. <gasps> and this turned our lives upside down because it was, uh, I think when you are any parent, whether it's their first child or their sixth child, but especially that first pregnancy, when you've never gone through it and stuff, you're, you're really not feeling like a parent yet. You're right. a parent to be. And all, and, and in our children, I really believe our mortality lies within our children. Yeah. And you think about all I thought about that day was I was so excited to have my daughters and that first hold of them is going to be taken away from me. The first smile, the first diaper change, the first day at school, um, their last day at school, graduating, walking down the aisle with them. All those memories that I hope to make and plan to make was being threatened and being taken away from us. And we were fortunate through some research um, a week later, we found, um, or very quickly, but a week later, we were in Florida with one of the fathers of fetal surgery that had done a, um, uh, had perfected, well, at the time was still being perfected, but was working on a treatment procedure where he could try to save them. And a week later, we found ourselves in Florida and they went minimally invasive through the womb use uh, what they call photoscopy, but it's basically a little laparoscope, tiny laparoscope that they go in through the womb. He mapped out the entire placenta, finds the vessels that they shared and uses a laser to seal them off so they can't have that transfusion anymore. And then the hope is that there's enough placental share for each of them and hope that there's enough blood supply and nutrients that can get to both of them that they'll survive. We were very fortunate back then 20 years ago we had kind of a uh, less than 50, we had less than 50% chance we'd have one survivor, let alone two. Yeah. And um, we have, you know, again, two beautiful, healthy girls that are graduating college. Uh, they've been amazing and tops of the, where they work harder than I ever did and still do. Um, I think I work pretty hard, but they're amazing and inspiring. And 
but that really changed our life too, because from that, um, about a year later, I decided to, um, my wife and I decided like, Hey, we got into running in life. Let's, let's create a 5k charity event. Mm -hmm. You know, every, every, it deals with kids. We'll have thousands of people and, yeah. and we'll be, we'll be the next Coleman. And um, uh, come to find out, putting on an event like that is a million moving parts. And uh, I always say the we were successful year one is that my wife didn't divorce me after the fact. Because <laughs> uh, it was not easy. And and we I say we were successful and raised some money, but there wasn't thousands of people there. And I didn't have internet, you know, national news banging on our door to get the story and stuff. Yeah. Um, but when kids, when I say go back to saying kids changed your life is that whole experience and overcoming that allowed us to also then realize that there was a need for other families. Besides having the event and raising money, there was a need for them to have support. Fetal anomalies, while TTTS is somewhat rare, it actually takes the lives of more kids per year than SIDS does. Wow. And, convert, and on that too, is that when you add up all fetal anomalies, on average, 150, 200 babies are dying every day from a fetal anomaly. Wow, And it's a pretty prevalent thing. And so we realized that there was really no organization that really was truly to be kind of all encompassing of all fetal anomalies that could be there to support families going through that, be their resource. Because I know when we yeah. went through it, our family didn't really have an understanding. Some understood the gravity that we could lose them. Some were just like, oh, you don't really, you, you probably misheard them. It's going to be fine. Yeah. No, it may not be fine. And uh, it was really hard because we felt very kind of isolated and alone. And it was tough because I wanted to be there for my wife, but I was also struggling with the potential loss of them in that time frame. And um, so we created um, the event kind of led us into creating one trajectory of, of life was creating an, an international foundation called Fetal Health that deals with all fetal anomalies. And we work to create research and help families all over the world going through this with support, advocacy, getting them in touch with the right centers. Unfortunately, as much as we'd love to live in this uh, wonderful utopia that in every suburb and every city that there's these wonderful fetal centers that can do treatments, it's such a specialized area that there's not. Yeah. Um, when we were going through it, there was only like three in the entire United States that even would attempt to treat any of this. Now there's a lot more, but right. it's a it needs such a highly skilled, specialized thing. So that led to the foundation. The other side led to, I was still working in the corporate world and um, we had our charity and we did this event. And then um, I started announcing for events. I, I offered my services. I loved Mike. I loved getting people excited. I loved storytelling. And I loved hearing people's whys, why they were doing events. And I started announcing for events and then I got hired uh, uh, by some uh, national series events. Um, and then that led me into connection with some of the most amazing people, a gentleman by the name of Cree Kelly, who was really kind of the forefront of, 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 was an elite athlete himself and was kind of the first to do everything as part of the running boom in the eighties that helped create that and created events. And um, also an international announcer and broadcaster and, um, became a good mentor for me. And that led me, him getting me into involved with a trade organization of the sport yeah. where I really learned a lot. And that set me on to my wife and I in 2009, creating Al Sports, which stands for Healthy Active Living, as we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is what we realized is that, you know, yes, there's the, the major marathons of the world and they have an amazing staff and they do this year round, but most community events, charity events, People are wearing many different hats, whether they're large or small organizations, and they don't necessarily have the expertise, nor did we at the, when we started out with an event, yeah. it was difficult, diff hard. And we learned that it would be so wonderful that we, yeah, we hire these people to come out and set up and do a good job, but they don't really help make my event better. And we wanted to be an indispensable partner with that. Yeah. Plus we wanted people, the participants to get to know who we were because we wanted again allow them that opportunity to create a great experience for them my wife and i actually met stacy at disney working on a college co-op program and so we come with that whole kind of pixie dust attitude pardon me sorry about that <laughs> we had a major part about that sidebar we had a major snowstorm and um shoveling's going on right now that said my thing in my car alarm just went off so just turn oh, wow. that off apologize for that interruption um Through creation of House Sports, 
um, we got this opportunity to work with so many amazing charities and stuff. And what I, what really changed our lives about it is allowed us to be altruistic. Uh, we make our living on helping organizations, better people, better themselves, provide resources for all many different things from ovarian cancer to um, homelessness help wow. to veterans needing help with PTSD. And it's been just such a wide plethora thing that people have gotten to meet is amazing. Yeah. Um, and through that, it's led to me learning and creating some very important things, which is um, how we've been successful. And what I like to teach to tell other people is in anything that you do in life, learn as much as you can about everything yeah. that you can listen to what people are saying before trying to be understood. And, and the most important thing is see if you can solve those things. Um, it can be on a personable level. Yeah. It can be on a, a business level. It can be on how you inter interject with your coworkers. Um, and the other fun thing that I really like is something I call PER squared. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's what I actually uh, have been fortunate enough to do some talks on is the P stands for in when you're dealing with things is always try to remember the P stands for personable. People like to have personable connections with yeah. you or for us, when we're putting together an event, they like an event to feel personable. They don't want to be cookie cutter and feel like you're just rushing them through. Yes. Um, another important thing is to be engaging. I mm -hmm. want things to be engaging. And the last part, which I call the R squared, which is kind of an, and it's reason it's squared, it's actually two R's, but it's, you need to be remarkable to be remarkable. Mm -hmm. And that can fit into a lot of different things on, if you think like when in the world of events, that's really important because it doesn't necessarily have to do all these crazy wild things, but you want something to be remarkable so that people talk about the event becomes remarkable. And when it's remarkable, it becomes exponentially growth, hence yeah. the squared. On a personal level, it's always reminding me personally to don't settle. And it's very easy. We all have bad days. Yeah. I pretend like we don't. I know sometimes, and you have it too, probably, um, you know, I think people see you and they think, wow, she changed her whole life around overcoming epilepsy and being in a coma. And all of your story is so miraculous to see what you're doing today um, and helping so many people reaching out and building uh, and speaking and inspiring people and changing people's lives to go through all that. You've done something remarkable and now you're remarkable because of that, because people are gravitating towards you. You're changing their lives. And I think in the same thing on a personal level is again, you know, you have, I'm sure you have days like, Oh, this did not go the way I wanted to, or this challenge happened and this happens and, and life does throw you curveballs. But for me, it's always remembering to, to, Every day, I'm not going to be my best. Right. I'm going to have bad days. I'm not going to be the person I want to be every day. Right. But it's okay. Give, you know, be, allow yourself um, some leeway, you right. know, allow yourself to be okay with that. Yeah. It doesn't make it right, but be okay with that and, and, and be apologetic to yourself. It's okay. Yeah. You know, forgive yourself. And if you, in the process, did any wrong to somebody, apologize to them. Say, hey, I wasn't having a good day or I wasn't my best, but come back, be remarkable, be the yes. person that you want to be. And what I always find out for me is I always look at what people need and be that person that they need at yeah. that time. Mm -hmm. Is it a listening ear? Is it they need help just doing something? Is it sometimes just sitting by them saying nothing, but they just right. need somebody by their side? Um, whatever that might be, is it guiding them? All those things is, I think you have this down very, very well, is that you start to learn what, as you meet people, what they need mm -hmm. and how to be there for them. Right. I think the more you communicate with others and the more you're able to not just see the outside picture, but really read them from the inside emotionally, you understand people and you understand what their needs are and you understand what they're, they're yearning for. And you're able to communicate on a, on a higher level, not just a, um, a verbal le level, but you could actually put yourself in their shoes and kind of get outside the box and, and, and imagine what life would be live in their life. And then by able to do in that, you're able to actually see things differently and then understand from their perspective, what they've gone through, what they're going through and, you know, how they're dealing with it. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and to bring kind of like a world world event and the event operations side of stuff, you know, unfortunately, um, we have a very challenging thing, I think, in many large and, and even small cities where we have a, a large migration, a lot of houselessness taking place, um, a lot of pop up tent locations and stuff. And it's very easy to for me to be sitting in my suburban home and and I could make judgment on on people. And, and regardless of where people are at, they didn't get there because they wanted to. Yes. Um, they want to be in those situations. And it's hard right. for them whether they have mental health issues or they got a drug addiction or they're just and some people truly are down on their luck. And I think the um, and, and an example of this is when we're setting up for events, safety is extremely important. Yes. And we, we have courses out on major uh, metropolitan areas um and sometimes we run into those and my first thought of that is not of well how can we get them out of the way um or how do we take care of that it's it's how can we help them at this moment yes and maybe that is approaching them <laughs> um being obviously always safety is important so you want to be cautious um again but it's a lot of times it's just if we will put together a little snack bag and just say hey we're having a major event um, you know, would you mind, uh, we need to have utilize this area for a bit for a few hours, here's some food, here's some water. Is there anything else I can do to help you? Do you right. need some help with something? Can I help provide you something? And, and most of the time, um, they respond very favorable to that no matter what condition they're in. Yeah. Um, and so again, it's kind of one of those things of, of some compassion, mm -hmm. like you said, you know, knowing people's stories, empathizing with them, kind of understanding what they might need in that moment. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, trying to make it safe because we have athletes coming through. You never know what's going to happen. And I don't know what my athletes or how the athletes are going to be or the peak participants are going to be. They might, you know, the 99% of them are wonderful and caring. And I, I, the running and walking events, I truly are kind of the, what I, the, the true first, um, you know, kind of G certified companies where they're doing good. You know, we yeah. have the, uh, um, Bomba socks of the world that every sock you buy, they donate a sock and stuff. And they think that's kind of a new thing, but really the uh, running and endurance event was kind of the first to do that because try to find a single running event or participant, massive participatory event that yeah. isn't doing something for a charity. Exactly. They're all doing it that. So um, um, again, kind of a, a, you know, going to that area of, of a real world thing of where you just have to be compassionate for people and yeah. help understand. Oh, a hundred percent. And I, I love how you're touching, you know, different conditions, especially ones that aren't really exposed a lot in the media. You see a lot of things about um, diabetes, high cholesterol, you know, um, high blood pressure and all these other things. But when it comes to certain conditions and certain diseases and illnesses, you don't see much of, of, of a lot of them that are very prevalent in our society. They're just not as prevalent as other things, but they don't get the attention that, that they, they, they need and the support that they need. So I definitely give you kudos for bringing attention to many of those, those conditions and illnesses, because we, we need more of that in our society. Yeah, thank you for that. And if you entertain me on this particular thing, going back to the fetal health side of stuff, it was shocking to me, um, you know, going through, because when you, until you go through a pregnancy, you really don't think of these things. Yeah. But um, the in the United States, and, and this isn't necessarily the United States, a lot of uh, developed countries, first world mm -hmm. countries, will typically um, kind of treat pregnancy to some extent like it's a disease, like yeah. it's a condition, you know, and and... And not in a negative way, but it's like, oh, you're pregnant. You should, you should, you know, take time off, rest, um, eat. You're going to eat for two. Well, yeah, there's a developing baby or babies in the womb, but they're really small. So it's not, you're really eating for two, <laughs> two. Um, but um, um, we, we kind of treat it like a condition and that you need to rest and stuff. Like, and obviously you have to be safe. You're not going to be out doing normal activities all the time, but right. um, part of a healthy pregnancy is being healthy yourself yeah. and not stopping. And yes, it, it you can have the ice cream and stuff too and your cravings, but make sure you're balanced. Make sure you're yeah. balanced with your sleep, balanced nutritionally, um, taking your vitamins, um, you know, getting exercise, being trying to be in a healthy lifestyle before or being as healthy as you can before being pregnant and during pregnancy. Yeah. The uh, it would change the trajectory of fetal anomalies. And they're not so much the anomaly. I mean, the anomalies are things that kind of happen that we don't know why, but there's a lot of fetal things that happen with gestational diabetes that can not only affect mom, but can really have adverse effects to the baby and for the whole, the life of the baby yeah. growing up can create negative things. 
just some of those things could reduce the number of cases of fetal cases that we have on a yearly basis, which is 800,000. Yeah. Um, you know, which is, it's still a small number compared to how many pregnancies happen. So most of the time it goes completely well, but just doing some of those things. And we see some third world countries or developing countries actually have better success rate um, with pregnancies than we do in the United States. And some of that's attributed to the kind of, I mean, lifestyle, let's face America's, we don't exactly aren't pinnacle in our health and how we, yeah. um, in our health in, in general, Yeah. but you look at their lifestyle, well, you know, they're, they're, they're working mom, you know, mom to be is still working is, is doing, uh, you know, you think in, in Cuba, they're out there in, in Cuba, they're out there the, the, the doing field. work, they're, they're cultivating mm -hmm. food, all these different things that we, you know, and we're sitting here watching Netflix all day. Yeah. Um, so just some of those things again, and it kind of, again, kind of goes back full circle to the kind of that whole healthy, active lifestyle of, right. of balance. It's very true. You know, in, in our United States alone, we've tripled in diabetes, like the food industry. It's so important to have a balanced, healthy uh, lifestyle. And we lack a lot of that in our United States. And, and, and one of the things is that people don't realize that everything we put in our body matters and that, you know, it has effect on us. If our body doesn't understand what is going inside our, our body, it can't break it down. If it can't break it down, it stores it. And if it stores it, it starts to, you know, it, it starts to get leached on as a toxin and it builds up in your body and you start to become sluggish and you start to not feel well. So certain symptoms might develop, certain conditions or illnesses might develop. And, you know, and people don't get enough of sleep. People over push themselves. 70% of illnesses are caused by stress. You know, there are so many things out there and, and, and a lot of the foods in the industry, if you go to other countries, most of the foods we ser serve and we sell in our food industry are banned in other countries. They won't even sell the foods that we sell in America because of the ingredients that we put into it, all the artificial ingredients and preservatives. They don't have that in other countries. They're eating more pure. A lot of the food is coming from their backyards, off trees, you know, in the ground. And they're not using all those pesticides either that we put on our foods, you know, to try to keep them fresh longer. But then, you know, they're cancer causing preservatives and even the dyes we put in our food you're making you know punch and all these other things and you're putting all these dyes and colors everything comes clear you know we're the ones who put all these different dyes to make them more marketable and and they're, they're not it's not helping us it's helping sales of the food industry but it, it it's killing us slowly and, and you wonder why so many people have cancer so many people have diabetes so many people have heart problems you know we have obesity in this country and 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 people are praising it's okay to be overweight. Well, it's not okay to be overweight because that opens us to more illnesses, you know, high cholesterol, heart problems, stroke, you know, um, diabetes, you know, and the list goes on and on and on, you know, so it, it, people have to realize that mind, body, and spirit all matter. So when I say mind, it's like learn how to handle stress, your mindset. And when I talk about health, it's really putting what you put in your body. You only need 15, 20 minutes of exercise each day. You don't have to go in the gym and be there for two, three hours. You can, you know, as long as you're moving your body and circulating that blood, you know, it's it, it's good for your body and, and you're doing good for yourself. And 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 people have to be in 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 at whole with each other. And when I say spirit, I I mean being able to you know connect and understand who you are as a person. You know what you need. Your body's always talking to you. Your body's always telling you when you have pains or aches or your joints are hurting you. Those are those are signs that things aren't going well, and your body's trying to heal it. And it's giving you signals to the brain that hey something's not right. You know you need to fix this. And people are just disregarding it going and getting medications, trying to get rid of the symptoms, then getting other symptoms from the other medication. And before you know it, they have a pharmacy in their, in their bathroom and they haven't solved the root cause yet. And, you know, it's yeah. an ongoing you know, you thing. Are, you're spot on and it kind of boggles my mind. You know, you're talking about the food in America and how we, you know, our FDA that seems to be so restrictive on things allows all these things to take place and other countries don't. And um, it's sad because, you know, we, we, it's all really hard to avoid these things and, yeah. and it is causing a lot of that. And we, we do are, we are much more sedentary and um, not only from the, you know, you mentioned obviously kind of just the active lifestyle, but 
um, you know, technology has technology has been a, a dual edged sword. There's been some wonderful things with technology. Obviously, the podcast that you and I are doing today and the way to interact has been phenomenal. But at the same time, like it's taken such a toll on our mental health where we've now live through, you know, the the world of of all these social media sites and engage this way. But it's really we've lost the ability to some extent to how to do personal bowl um, relation with people and have yeah. personal connections with people unless it's through a device and mm -hmm. um, and it takes you know it, it, it whether we're working too hard or we get kind of down the uh, addicted rabbit hole of looking at oh that one YouTube video leads into another leads into another or that Instagram post leads into another and before you know it you've been four hours on Instagram right and you you know the mental health toll that this plays on on society and healthy and like you mentioned stress like cortisol is is wonderful for its intended purpose <laughs> but it is too it is too much too much of it and too much it it you can you know we've in the world of of obviously health and fitness and you know this probably better than i do um cortisol levels can be so high that you can work out four hours a day and eat a thousand calories and you won't lose a pound exactly your cortisol levels will just keep anything from happening yeah um and so the when you mentioned sleep sleep is in such an important thing your body heals during that time it repairs itself during that time you feel better and the rest is so much and i think that you know, i don't know what the numbers are maybe you know but we're so sleep deprived in the united yeah. states and probably in the, the world but especially the united states and again it just leads to well I'm, I'm trying to get healthy but i can't lose any weight well you're also stressed and you're you need to take care of yourself not only the physical side you need to take care of the mental side too and the yeah. sleep is such a important component on it. It's very true. You know, a lot of people lack sleep in it. You'll see many people they'll talk about insomnia uh, and it's because people can't rest that people, you know, there's, you know, either there's something in their body that's off and it's causing the insomnia or they're on a medication that's causing the insomnia or it's the foods they're eating or they're on the computer and the device is too long and their minds can't relax and they're so strung up before they go to bed that they can't get to that point where they're actually can fall asleep and get into that REM mode. And, uh, you know, so there's so many reasons for this, but people have to really prioritize and really plan, you know, how, you know, you know, what is their future? What do I want to see myself as in, in the next, you know, year, the next three years, the next five years, when I get older, you know, what type of person do I want to be? Do I, do I want to be a, an aging person that has all aches and pains? Or do I want to be a vibrant, you know, older person that, that is enjoying life and, and not suffering, you know, and, and we, you have to start now, you know, no matter what age you are, you know, the earlier you start taking care of yourself, the better you will feel, the better you will think, the better you will focus and the more productive your life will be. And, yeah. And yeah. on that particular thing, it reminds me in the, um, uh, this is wonderful gentleman by the name of Eddie Lyons. He started running when he was in the sixties. Now he was, he was, um, um, Grew up uh, in the, 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 was born in the, the 30s, grew up in the 40s, obviously, and went through the, a lot of uh, the World War and, and stuff during that time frame and um, served his country and stuff. So he kind of came from a different cut cloth and, and stuff. So he was always pretty healthy, but he started running in his 60s. And um, Stacy, today, he's 92 years old and he finally retired from running. So he was out there at 90. And I remember when he was 80, when he was in his eighties, he would call this up and he's like, Lonnie, you know, I just can't, I can't compete with these young 70 year olds anymore. I, <laughs> an I need an age group because I, that, that award means something to me. And I'm like, absolutely Eddie. And then uh, we named the award after him, the Eddie Lyons award. And then the 70 year olds turned 80 and Eddie turned 90. So of course we made a 90 and over age group because if you're 90 years old out there and he was still finishing you know, still beating 20, 25% of the people at 90 wow. years old, you wouldn't think he was 90. He was, he's, um, um, unfortunately he kind of decided, you oh, know, my eyesight's getting bad and I can't really drive the event. So it's not safe for me to go out there. And I know he misses it, but to be 92 and out there running five Ks and four mile races still, yeah. um, and just as gung ho. And I have family members, I'm sure we all can relate that are 20, 30 years younger than he is that, 
would get winded going up five flights of stairs. And right. um, that's really sad because it's like you are, yeah, he's older than you, but he's a hundred times more healthier than you are. Right. And he's in those and his moments of his of his life, he's living those so much more fulfilled. Yeah. It's um, and I I aspire and inspired by him and I aspire to be him because I want to keep moving, keep moving and and I always think it's so nice because he reminds me of some of the simpler things that we forget. Yeah. With our crazy world today. And he would he would pick up a phone and actually call <laughs> and say, Hey, I just want to let you know I'm thinking of you today. Thank you for doing what you do. Or he will put a, a handwritten note in the mail, the actual mail, not email. Yeah. Um, that is right. As opposed to all the political ads and other flyers that you get in the mail, a real handwritten note just saying, thank you. You mean something to me and thank you for what you do. And it just kind of reminds me like, Ooh, sometimes hit the brakes. Yeah. Hit the brakes and be appreciative of people and have connections with people because, um, and I, I see it in my children, how quickly and how the hustle and bustle of the world is, um, from when we grew up, you know, when we grew up, I feel like it seemed like forever to get through high school and it seemed like forever for the holidays to get around and forever for your birthday to get around. And, and, you know, I think our parents are always like, it goes fast, but it yeah. does. But now I look at my children and they kind of, and when I was their age, it was like, everything seems slow, but for them, it's so super fast. Yeah. So it's going at such a fast pace. And before you know it, it's going to be like, wow, I never, I never experienced this and I never did that. And I never just took time out to just enjoy. Yeah. You know, don't, don't, don't negate your responsibilities that are important to you. Prioritize, obviously, right? Look at what's really important. Those things that don't fit within what's important to you. Right. Fall down below. But, and so we have responsibilities and sometimes it's not perfect, but put what's prioritized, what's important to you and, and try to spend most of your time doing that. I know for me, it's, um, you know, again, healthy, active, uh, being healthy and active is important. It's balanced, but having time with my family, getting the, making the best of the opportunities I can. And then, you know, every, every day, kind of like for me, brushing teeth is, uh, is doing a little bit of active. It not only is it good for my health, but it's good for my mental health and yes. reframes my day for me. It's, it's true. You know, if we can prioritize and we can, you know, learn how to live a, a balanced life, you know, life could be so much grand, grander than what it is. And you could actually enjoy life. I see so many people stressing over everything and, you know, life does go by so quickly and you can't enjoy life if you're always worrying and worrying. And I say, well, you can't change the past. And if you worry in the future, you know, most people worry about things that haven't even occurred yet, you know, and how do you enjoy life? And and why are you making a problem before it even becomes a problem? Enjoy the present and learn how to live a happy and healthy, productive life and and be able to enjoy it because like it does go by so quickly. And I think even today's generation, like you mentioned, it goes by even quicker because they have so much more stress than we did you know we we had an easier lifestyle but we we did a lot but it, it wasn't it wasn't so stressful like it is today and the expectations weren't pressed on you like they are today absolutely Stacey let me ask you if I could ask you a question um sure. I, I received uh I'm completely fascinated and inspired by all that you've done do you have a particular moment in your life that you can pinpoint that really made a change for you and in what ways you want to really help people? I think it was the, the moment where um, I had gone through a lot in life with my epilepsy and um, I was let go of a very um, big position because I had a seizure and uh, one of the executives saw me have a seizure and walked right over me and kept walking. And shortly after I, I was let go of my position and I realized that, you know, I wasn't going to let it get me down. I said, one day I'll be a success. And then I started to work with a lot of different people and I did my own freelance business. And then I met a holistic, um, uh, um, a person that he was a holistic, uh, um, doctor and he, well, not doctor, but he was in the holistic uh, industry and he wanted me to do a lot of research and writing, um, about holistic living. And so I started to apply a lot of the stuff I was learning. Cause I was like, wow, this could really help me. Wow. This could really help me. 
And my seizures went from 12 to nine to eight to seven to the point where they became controlled with the combination of my medication. I changed my complete lifestyle. I changed the way I ate. I changed the way I slept. I changed, I learned how, to, I learned different coping techniques that hadn't handle stress. I added different supplements. I did detox. And then I decided, you know, to write a book. Um, I had, I had, had created a book in, in college um, cause I went through a lot of difficulties back then with my epilepsy. And I said, one day I'm going to finish it because I had wrote an article in a magazine and I asked people how they cope with epilepsy. And I got over three to 400 responses. And uh -huh. I said, and I said, one day I'm going to put these letters together and somehow I'm going to write a book. And so I used the, what I learned, the regiment that I learned that I applied to my life. And I used those stories and put them together and created a book called epilepsy. You're not alone. And then one day I received a email and someone said, I found your book in Barnes and Nobles and I was on the verge of suicide and you saved my life. And I just want to say thank you. And it was then I realized that the, the power of the words of wisdom, how much it really, what you say can really affect a person's life and the, and the feeling of achievement that I, I actually helped to save a, an individual's life was so rewarding that words couldn't even explain how rewarding it felt. And that's when I realized that working in the city, becoming a big executive or working in the media field wasn't really what I was meant to be. And, and, it, and it wasn't my, my true calling in life. And to me, I learned that my true calling in life was to help others. And so I, I followed my, my destiny. I followed my journey and I just let life, I let, I kind of let, um, you know, life, life kind of take control of my journey. And I, I followed the, the, the signs that, you know, my spiritual guides gave me and uh, it brought me to this point in life. And I just, you know, the more, I, the more I did, the more I helped people, the more responses I got, the more, the more, um, you know, intrigued it became a, my, 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 my love for it became my true passion and it became my, my life career. And uh, it was uh, it to this day, it's always, it, it, it gives me the, the, the will to want to wake up in the morning. It gives me the will to want to be who I am because it, it, it's, it's such a good feeling when you can actually help others because I've been through so much and to be able to use my knowledge and to be able to take other people's knowledge and put it all together and maybe help somebody out there means a lot. Well, that's phenomenal. You're, you're truly inspiring and you've overcome a lot um, to get to that and then to turn it around and obviously see a need to help people. And, um, you know, it reminds me of, of the, um, um, I'm going to telling stories at, at events and you never know. I mean, there's so many people that come to your site and listen to your podcasts and you have that one note that really sees you see the impact that this person was ready to take their own life and you changed their life around and made it better. And I think for what we do on our fetal health side and even what I do on the event side, there's so many lives that we touch that we don't even know how we're changing them. Yeah. Um, it's, it's nice to, to hear. So listeners out there, when you are when you get a chance, uh, thank Stacy for what she's done and others that have inspired your life because it, it helps them remember why they do it because it can be hard at times. I know in the event side, you know, we're getting up at three o'clock in the morning and, and some of the non-glamorous stuff is your you know, moving porta potties around and, and, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. Or I have to you know, shovel snow or do this <laughs> however it can be. And it's not very glamorous at times, but then, you know, recently we had a, um, a lady that, um, uh, one of our workers was at the event and she found me. She's like, I gotta tell you this lady's story. She was paralyzed from the neck down a year ago. Wow. Um, and had overcome that and decided that she wanted to challenge herself to do a half marathon. A year ago, she was paralyzed and never know if she'd ever walk again. And here she was completing a half marathon and she didn't have family or friends there cheering her on. It was just herself. Oh, wow. And so we found out about it and we like, we celebrated her. I was like, that's amazing. That's such an amazing story. Cause you yeah. think, you know, we able-bodied people today are sitting around going, never do anything like they don't have to do a half marathon, but the, there's people doing so many miraculous things to, and they're doing it to prove to themselves they can because yeah. they want to, they want to experience it, but in return, they inspire so many. And, and to, for us, the, to lay that basically to create the, the, um, venue, to create that opportunity for them to inspire others and inspire themselves is what keeps us going on a daily basis. And the, the, it comes full circle again to us because then we get to hear their stories and it just yeah. makes it even more, um, 
even more fulfilling for us to continue doing what we do and getting up at the early morning hours and and creating that because it's with this it's such an amazing positivity that are there you know that yes right. so the overall event is helping a charity and then everyone's there for their individual reasons and stories and it's such an amazing amount of of positivity and and um an amazing community and stuff so that's what keeps us keeps us going on a daily a daily basis for it we love it yeah you know it, it being able to um, do something that you love and and know that you're making a positive impact on people's lives is, is truly a blessing you know and i i really thank you for everything that you you've uh done you know you you've gone through a lot in life and you didn't let it get get, get it get it down you didn't let you it, those situations get you down you took them and you you learned from them and you overcame them and now you're helping so many people and even with your program and your company your organization you're helping so many people and and building their self esteem and and helping them realize you know that they could do anything they put their mind to and and that can affect them in in so many ways and and just receiving a reward and just re be able to achieve something you know can actually change someone's whole trajectory on life and and how they feel about themselves and and their goals and you know, people don't realize that these, these things that might seem small are actually huge. You know, now, if you had to take what we discussed today and you had to give away a couple of takeaways and emphasize on a couple of important things, what would you like to tell the listeners and, and, and emphasize on some of the important factors that we went over today? Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's interesting. I have, I have uh, something that I say at every event at the, uh, that I remind people of, and I think it really sums up everything is, um, metaphorically, and sometimes even realistically, when you're doing an event, the finish line is never the end. It's the beginning of possible. I love that. And, um, and I think that really summarizes everything is, is you, know, you think metaphorically, when you're doing events, you start out, you're all excited and gung ho, and there's going to be times where it's going to hurt and it's not going to be so fun. And there's going to be some challenges along the way. And, and obviously there's some people that having a fantastic event, but most people are going to have ups and downs during a, an endurance event. Yeah. And getting to that finish line is an emotional time for them because they made it, they finished it, whatever their reason. And again, if they're paying tribute to a loved one they lost and they're there raising money or they miss that person, it's emotional for them. If they, if the lady that overcame paralysis and was doing her first half marathon, it's emotional and meaningful for her to her. And again, it's kind of like, okay, you reached that goal, but now you've just proven what's possible. Yeah. There's nothing that isn't possible. And that's through my stories and your stories for anyone out there, no matter where you're at right now, you can always change and be who you want to be and do the things you want to be tomorrow. And it doesn't come right away. Again, it's kind of the same thing of trying to get to that finish line. There's going to be some ups and downs and maybe sometimes your path has to change a bit, but yeah, try to wake up every day and realize that truly as tough as life is and, and stuff at times. And we like to say life is tough and life is hard. And yeah, it is, but there's some beautiful things about it. There's some amazing things about it. If we just kind of pause and reprioritize our lives and, and make health and make balance a priority. And, and really for us, I think the biggest thing too, it's really true though, what you give to others, you give back tenfold. Right. And, and I think that's been true for us because it keeps us me inspired and moving forward. So, but yep, 100%. The finish line is never the end. It's the beginning of possible. Wow. That's powerful. Thank you so much. It's been a, a pleasure having you on the show, Lonnie. I hope we could have you on again. And you, your stories are just incredible. And they're so inspirational and so motivational. And I think that's what people need to hear are, are these type of stories because life doesn't end because an obstacle comes in our way. You know, whatever comes in our way, you know, you realize that, you know, in the worst times of our lives that we felt like, you know, life was just crumbling, you know, on top of us. And, and we felt like we were, we were knocked down to the ground. We've always overcome those issues, you know, in, in, during the time that it happens, we go through painful and stressful times. But if you notice, we always got through it one way or another, we were able to get through it. And I say from every negative thing that happens to us in life, you could always pull something positive out of it and focus on the positive. It made you stronger, made you look at life differently. It gave you the momentum to want to do X, Y, and Z. So it's, you know, always take, always 
pull every positive out of a negative and always remember that life doesn't end because you got hit with an obstacle. You'll learn from it and you'll move on and you'll become better the next time. Yeah, I love that. I think that, you know, the, for me, it reminds me that life is, um, um, the easy things in life are not what make your life. It's the challenges in life that make you grow and learn and, and be able to um, have success. Um, exactly. You know, if success wouldn't be called success if it was so easy to get to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and it, takes a lot of, it takes a lot of failures and setbacks along the way to get there. But in doing so, that's how you get to success is by having those. And again, it's okay to have bad days. It's okay to have a not great day and be strong all the time, but yes. to, to kind of regroup and refocus and, and keep moving forward, you'll get there. I love that. Thank you so much, Lonnie. This has been wonderful. Stacey has been an absolute honor and privilege and, and please continue to keep doing what you do. Uh, you were involved in how you have your hat and uh, yourself in a lot of wearing many different hats, <laughs> and, but keep, keep doing it. Keep inspiring. And, and the same goes to you. Keep inspiring because your your stories and everything you've accomplished in your organization is just outstanding. So you keep doing what you're doing too because you're you're making positive change in this world. And I thank you for that. I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Same here. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.